Again, Father, we want to praise you for the goodness that you have for, toward us and giving us through your scriptures the information we need to know how to function, especially as a church. We're thankful for our church and we pray your blessing upon it constantly. But we pray that you would bless this particular session as we look again at the various ways that people have organized the church through the years and then what we feel is the biblical way. So we trust that you will, through the Spirit of God, inform us of the things that are necessary and bless us because of it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, we're talking about the government of the church. Chapter 9, Lesson 9. This is how the church is organized. Uh, and uh, there's quite a few things to, interesting to look at, I think. The organization of the church is the means it has for operating, how it is functioned, how does it, uh, where does that authority ride, and how do the people in it, or the leadership, and all that stuff. So there's a whole bunch of things that have to do with the government of the church. And, uh, people through the years have done all kinds of different things, so we're going to look at some of them. Dr. Erickson, in his theology book, introduced his chapter on the subject by stating, quote, The question of church government is in the final analysis a question of where authority resides within the church and who is to exercise it. Now, there are four major ways that the church has been organized throughout history. Now, there are many others, smaller denominations or organizations that have uh, changed and so on. We're not going to be uh, talking about any of them at all because they're so insignificant and so rare. Most of the churches, at least the, well, most of the churches, including the Roman Catholic Church, function under uh, one of the four major government ways that we're going to be looking at this morning. So I'm going to start out with the Episcopal. This is the term as a transliteration of the Greek word episkopos. And so that's where the Episcopal word came from. And again, like the King James, it did not translate it. It transliterated it. And so made it just took the episkopos and made it English and it came out of Episcopal. So it, uh, the definition is there. This, this form is characterized by a hierarchy of personnel with the lower levels being under the authority of the higher. So you've got several tiers of leadership within the Episcopal organization, okay? For instance, the United Methodist Church has a single level of bishops in which their authority resides over pastors. So there's only one group of people outside of the local church in the Methodist denomination, and that is the, the bishops. They call them the bishops. And again, that's a word that's taken from the King James Version that was never translated, but it refers to a leader. Uh, but that's the only level that they have, but this is over the local church. And so the, the people on the, uh, uh, the, this Episcopal organization has the opportunity and the privilege of, for instance, naming the pastor for the local churches that are within its area. Now, most of the time in the Methodist church, they will, they will work with the local congregation to see if the congregation has any preference along the way. But they can, on their own, just appoint who is going to be the pastor. And they can change that appointment anytime they want. And so all of a sudden, the Methodist guy is gone, and somebody else is in their place because they, the organization has worked and made that decision. The bishops of the district is the person who, to whom a church with problems goes for advice. The bishop has the authority to place the pastors in his district, often in consultation with the congregations. Hmm. Now, the Roman Catholic system, there are several levels, including bishops, archbishops, cardinals, and finally a single supreme authority in the Pope of Rome. Each level has its own realm of control, 
but is always subject to the next higher level. The ordination of new ministers is in the head of the hierarchy. Uh, the church, a local church in the Catholic Church, will not ordain a minister. That's done by some of the, the bishops or whatever that's higher above. They have the authority to do that. And again, they can place the people as they want. The clergy is a distinct category which is honored above the congregation and separate from it. Each level of authority is chosen from above, not from the people. The successor to the Pope, since there is no higher human authority, is chosen by the College of Cardinals, who were selected by the Pope in the first place. So this is where you run out. The Pope is it, there isn't anybody above him, and therefore if you have to replace the Pope, it's the next group down, the archbishops that do that. And of course the archbishops are a limited number of people who basically function out of the uh, land of Italy. Now the bishops at some level have the responsibility for preserving the faith. Let's, let's take a look here at some of these things. This is high, the Episcopal. The higher the level, the greater the authority. The highest level usually is a bishop. The Catholic Church has others. And the local bishop serves the others other bishops that care govern a, a group of churches, okay? Now, a bishop is chosen by the other bishops. So even the church has no stay in who their pastor is gonna be, who the bishop is gonna be, who anybody, they have no say. That's all done through the hierarchy and through the authority that, that's above them. The particular power of a bishop is the ordination of ministers as priests. It's the bishops that can ordain a person to become the priest. Now, there's a sense in which, um, in my ordination, for instance, we had, uh, in my case, all of the pastors, I think there were 11 of them, of the regular Baptist churches in the southeastern Minnesota or southern Minnesota. So these people from Cassin, Austin, all came over. They were they were the committee, uh, plus one of the gentlemen in our church besides the pastor, and then the pastor that I worked with at that time I was working in Rockford, so he came up and was part of the committee. So they are the ones that did it, but it actually was the church, my my church, my local church, First Baptist Church in Rochester, is actually the church that gave the uh, the uh, ordination certificate signed by all of the men who were involved in it. So that's uh, where the, the authority from it comes from. So it's, it's somewhat similar to this, you know, the ordination here is done by the priests. So this would be all the priests or the pastors from different organizations or churches. He also has the authority to place the pastors in the churches. He has the responsibility to maintain true faith in his churches with proper order and discipline. So the, the bishop is an important person related to a particular church. He has a lot of control and authority and responsibility in that local church. Now this is the most developed form of Roman Catholicism. We've talked about this already. Now the Pope is the only person who may speak for God, a practice known as ex cathedra, or from the cathedral. It's Latin. Any such ruling can never be reversed or altered. In any such proclamation, he is infallible. Now that doesn't mean that everything the Pope says is infallible. Only when he speaks ex cathedra. In other words, when, I'm not sure how this specified whether he determines that it, I think it probably is. He says that what I'm gonna be saying today, the, uh, the information or requirement or rule or whatever that he's going to say, this is ex cathedra. In other words, this is my direct response from what I've heard from God. He's taken the place as it would of the Old Testament prophets who would say, you know, they said, thus saith the Lord. Well, I don't think the Pope uses those words, but he is uh, assuming that same responsibility and authority. Now, the major check on his authority is he can't appoint his successor. 
he is pope until he dies or until he resigns. Uh, most of them die before they resign. We had a pope, a couple back, I think one or two back that resigned because his health failed to such a place that he couldn't function anyway. So, uh, so another one was appointed to replace him. All right, let's go on. <clears throat> Bottom paragraph now. Roman Catholic Church bases their apostolic authority upon Matthew 16, 19, which says, Jesus said, I will give you, this is the apostles now, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In fact, this particular verse, when Jesus spoke these words, he actually spoke to Peter. And because that is the case, the Roman Catholic Church assumes that Peter then was given these uh, opportunities, privileges for leadership that Jesus just quoted here. And if he has it, then it, it follows down in his descendants or uh, those who to follow the Peter. So Peter was the first pope, according to the Roman Catholic Church. And this is it. Now, what they failed to do is to look at another passage of scripture, I don't think I put it in here, in which Jesus said virtually the same thing, but he said it to all of the apostles, not just to Peter. All of the apostles were there and he spoke to them and said, you, the apostles, are uh, have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And uh, they had the authority to bind or loose whatever that was. Judine, what, what do they mean by the keys to the kingdom? What's that supposed to imply? Because keys... Well, it, it, it's uh, the privilege of opening or closing, locking, whatever. So there's um, multiple keys to get in? I thought there was only one way oh, to no, get in. Well, it's in the plural in the scripture, so that evidently it's, it's the keys. In other words, especially when he was speaking to the apostles, it would have to be plural. Now, Peter supposedly has the key, or the Pope does, but uh, uh, the, the statement that Jesus made, which is virtually identical to this, was to the apostles, so it's keys. But it's limited to the apostles at that point. But then, of course, the, the, uh, the same authority passes on to others after the apostles are gone. Okay. Now, keys are intended to open, or to prohibit opening of something like a door or a chest. Roman Catholics believe that Peter has the ultimate authority to open the gates of heaven. Thus the familiar references to he, he being the gatekeeper in heaven. How many times have you heard when I see St. Peter at the gate to heaven? I know how to get in. Why? Well, that's, you know, it's a carryover from the Roman Catholic Church, feeling that Peter is the leader of, Obviously, he's going to be the one who has the key to heaven as well. Of course, that's, uh, that's imaginary at that point. Now, it seems a better understanding of the keys is that Peter was permitted and used by God to introduce the gospel to the world, to the Jews at Pentecost in Acts 2 and 3, and to the Gentiles in Acts 10. So Peter had a privilege that God gave him of reaching the... the uh, the uh, uh, people outside of the Jewish nation. Remember, he saw with the, the uh, authority, he saw a, 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 a veil or something coming out of heaven with dirty animals in it, and God said to eat. Peter said, I can't eat, they're dirty. And God says, well, I've cleaned them. Everything I've said is clean, and so you eat it. And he had to do three times because Peter was so determined that he wasn't going to violate that law. So he was very careful. But he had that privilege. So the privilege, again, in Acts chapter 10, uh, he had that privilege. That chapters 2 and 3 is when he was actually preaching up to Pentecost. And uh, obviously he introduced the gospel there with 3,000 people becoming believers. The binding and loosing are not decisions Peter makes that are then confirmed in heaven but are decisions made in heaven that are confirmed by the apostles. If interested, see the discussion of the grammar of this passage in Glasscock's commentary. 
some of you may have that Moody commentary. You could look it up if you want. Uh, I didn't try to quote all of that information. I didn't think it was necessary, but he goes into much more detail. Now, the same authority for the keys was extended to all the apostles in chapter 18, verse 18, where the word you, Jesus said you, but it's in the plural, not, not in the singular. As one looks at the rest of the New Testament record of the apostles, quote, it should be noted here that nowhere in the New Testament is there any hint of a bishop as a monarch or supervisor over other leaders in the church. Most modern versions never even mention the word bishop. It has been eliminated because uh, in almost every case, the Methodists haven't dropped it, but uh, most everybody has. Now, among the objections is a seeming emphasis upon the position more than upon the person holding it. Move we'll on here again. The Pope claims to be authoritative because he is in direct lineage with Peter, who was proclaimed the first Pope. There's no reasonable proof in Scripture for this claim. And they acknowledge that. There is no proof of it in claim. They, they just, it's the way they interpret that passage in Matthew. Um, and now by direct lineage, it's not like uh, uh, it's not like Jesus being in the line of David, for instance. That every every one of his predecessors was a, a person of the of the heritage or part, uh, family of David. That's that's not the case of Peter. It isn't that Peter had a son and that son became the pope and that son became the pope and so on. It's just uh, the the authority the. Uh, the uh, authorization that is given to the next one. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the lineage that they're talking about. Now, Paul warned against such people, quoting, he said, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And so it's, even the scriptures give some warning against people who would claim that kind of authority. And it fails to observe Christ's claimed authority. Just before Jesus went back to heaven, he said, all authority has been given unto me from the Father. So he has all the authority, it's his. Nobody else has any charge for it, no authority to, to try to overrun it or anything else. That has never been overturned. And in fact, it's even talked about later in the epistles when Christ has already been back in heaven, that uh, he is still the head of the church. Um, Let's go on here in the uh, passage. <clears throat> Among the objection, objections to the seeming emphasis upon the position more than upon the person holding it. This is important because we have strong warnings against unqualified leaders. Paul describes some of them in 2 Corinthians 11, quoting, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. Finally, there is insufficient evidence that any elder in a church had any authority delegated by Christ to rule the church. Instead, Jesus was declared to be the head of the church in Colossians 1.18, where it says, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning. He is the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. When the apostles wrote to the churches, they either addressed the church as a whole, for instance, in 1 Corinthians 1, 2, you can look at any of the epistles, with the exception of Ephesians, every other epistle, when it's addressed by Paul or Peter or whoever, uh, was addressed to the church, not to the leaders, not to the elders of the church, except that one occasion. Um, There may be an implication in the examples of Timothy and Titus that they were senior pastors, but it was also to them that Paul gave the clearest and most detailed instructions about elders and deacons. So even though Paul wrote to them as men, he didn't write to the church, he wrote to them individually as men. And of course they were, they were in the position of pastoring the churches after Paul was gone. Okay, any questions about the Episcopal?
You, you yes. mean, is that the same way in Revelation when the Lord speaks to the churches there? Like you said, he always refers Paul when he was always mm -hmm. directed his, his writings to the church. Well, the church, the letters to the churches in, in uh, Revelation, there are seven of them, yeah. were addressed to the angel of the church. Not didn't say the word pastor, didn't give any term, just the term angel. And the, the word that is translated from the Greek into angel is the word that really means messenger. We're looking at that next quarter when we look at angels and demons. So uh, I think most people believe that those letters were actually written to the pastors of those churches, but uh, it doesn't state it that way. Paul that, or John didn't use the term pastors, he used the term mm -hmm. angel. Was that a geological location then to those churches, all the churches combined there, and do we have the same thing? Uh, I'm not, what do you, the, you know, you said there was a church, an uh, angel over the church. Yeah. Do we do we have the same thing you think in the churches today? Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't see any reason to believe that we do. There's no, uh, when Christ is a superior over the church, that means that no angel or anybody else. In fact, you remember in, in Galatians when Paul was writing to the church there, one of the things he stated, it says, even if an angel came to you and preached another gospel, don't believe it. So God never put that responsibility onto an angel. So that's why I kind of feel that the, the angel of the people in uh, Revelation maybe were not pastors, but I'm not sure what they would be other than that. But it really makes no difference, you know, the content of what's there. It's, it's a warning, basically, for churches who had wandered in some ways from their original beliefs. Hmm. Okay, well, let's move on then to the next one. Now, this form, Presbyterian, also has a hierarchy, but the emphasis is not so much upon individuals in authority as authoritative bodies. The key person is the elder in the church, the local church, the reason a body of elders seem to have authority is because the word usually occurs in the plural, suggesting that it is a group rather than an ind individual. In, in Acts 20, for instance, when Paul was going back to Jerusalem, he wanted to talk to the elders from Ephesus, and so he called for the elders, plural, at Ephesus. Every time the term uh, of the... the uh, Man is referred to in relation to the church. He's always referred to in the plural. So the sense was there, there was not to be a single uh, elder. Um, I have an example. I think I mentioned this to you earlier. I, my daughter goes to a very small Presbyterian church. They only have about 20 people in the church. And it's been that way for years. It's a very good church. Both the pastor and his wife were birthed graduates of Moody, so they're preaching the gospel very stringently and so on. But at any rate, um, because they had so few people, they, don't, they didn't even have an elder for quite a while. The elder that was assigned to them by the Presbytery was a guy who lived in Grand Rapids, Michigan. They lived in Fowlerville, Michigan, which was probably about 50 miles away. So anytime they wanted to, to ask a question or get the help of an elder, they had to contact their elder in Grand Rapids and have him come over. Well, they finally have elected at least one elder from their church. And my son-in-law is now the elder of the church. They may even have a second man, I don't know about that yet, but finally Paul is uh, uh, an elder at the church there. But <clears throat> uh, normally it's in the plural because that's what you need to expect. Now, Authority is delegated by the congregation to the chosen elders who, meeting in council, make decisions on behalf of the congregation. Let's take a look now. This form differs in that it has a series of representative bodies which exercise authority. They don't have a bishop. They don't have any individual above the elders of a local church. But they have groups of men who are committees, or uh, whether they don't call them committees, but they're, they have that authority. Uh, 
The authority of Christ, this is again Miller Erickson, the authority of Christ is to be understood as dispensed to individual believers and delegated by them to the elders who represent them. So there the authority rests now on that. Now let's go on and I'll explain a little bit more about this, okay? Authority is delegated at the local level, there may be known as a session, if it's a Presbyterian church, or if it's a Reformed church, they would call it a consistory. So this is the name of that group of people who is above the elders in local churches. And these groups would be over a, a geographical area with several churches to whom they have responsibilities, either the session or the consistory. All the churches in the district are led by either a presbytery or a classis. A synod, it's another term that they use, this consists of elders and clergy who are over the presbytery or classes. So this is a third level above the local church. This is the, uh, the presbytery and the synod, and uh, that's, that's the top group and the top authority. That uh, top grouping is what they call the General Assembly. When they meet together, it's a General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church, and it's usually hundreds of people that are brought together because it, this is a big organization and they've got a wide geographical area to cover also. Now, a synod consists of elders and clergy who are over the Presbytery or the classes. The top grouping is the General Assembly. Local representatives to the Senate and the General Assembly are chosen by the Presbytery. So even the representatives above the local church are not selected by the church. They're selected by the other leaders. Each level makes its decisions regarding the denominational churches and is subject to review by all higher levels. The highest body of authority is a given area is the General Assembly made up of both lay and clergy representatives. There's, in other words, these could not only be elders from a local church, but there could be lay people from a local church that would serve on this overruling body, the General Assembly. So the elders are not, or the uh, lay people are not completely left out of it. The next is the Senate, made up of an equal number of elders and clergy, chosen by a church. And the next is the local level leaders called a classis or session. So these are what I've already covered here. Um, selection and placement of pastors is made by the session, but must be approved by the presbytery. In some cases, the title of the property is also held by the presbytery, not the local assembly. And every once in a while, if you find a church that's closing, if it's a denominational church, this is fairly common, the people who went and attended to that church and have supported it and so on, they do not own it as a body. If they leave the church and they, they're no longer going to be a Presbyterian church, the Presbytery owns that building, and then they can dispose of it however they want to, probably sell it to another church. But the local church doesn't own it. They, they just, they're participating in it, but it's not theirs to function. Now, the difference between this and the Episcopal system is that there's only one level of clergy. Officers in the higher levels are usually lay people selected from below to preside at meetings and to be, to be executives to carry out the will of the body. Terms of the service are normally limited. It's not a lifetime. It's not a step to a higher body. On the local level, there are often ruling elders and teaching elders, especially in the Reformed churches. They have two categories. There's always a deliberate coordination of people, of the clergy and lay people. The ruling elders and teaching elders, because of what they do, you know, have some, those who are teachers, that's a separate group. It's not actually separate as part of the elders, but uh, separate in terms of their responsibilities. Supporters of this system point to the example of the Jewish synagogue, which seems to have had some kind of a governing council. Paul exhorted the Thessalonians, quote, Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, 
who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Now it doesn't state by a term who these people are. He's just saying, brothers, respect those who work hard among you. And he's talking about the church membership, honoring those people who are doing that work on their behalf. Doesn't say that they are elders or deacons or term is used here at all. We probably would assume he's talking about elders. The decision-making process in Acts 15 could support it. The participation and authority of the people is maintained much better than in the Episcopal system. We'll, we'll look at that in a little more detail too a little bit later. Objections include the fact that the hierarchy is not found in Scripture. Some also object because people in the higher level sometimes usurp power to themselves, even to overruling local decisions, or failing to refer decisions back to the local church when appropriate. Authoritative power is always tempted to usurpation. Ah, next one. Congregationalism. All right. Congregationalism recognizes the authority of the church, but, re but re believes that it resides in the membership. Congregationalism began some years after the Reformation. So this is a, a, a principle of governing in the church that started only 500 years ago, roughly. And before that didn't exist, or if it did, we, we we have no proof of it. We don't know what, how some of the earlier churches functioned, so we, we're not sure if it existed or not. But it, it came back into a situation after the Reformation, which is kind of interesting because you see the Presbyterians and the Reformed come directly out of the Reformation. They, they trace their denomination back to certain people. You got John Calvin, and you got others, uh, the, the Reformers, who kind of led different groups, and because they came out of Roman Catholicism, they didn't, they didn't completely eliminate, they got rid of the Pope, and the archbishops, and the bishops, but they kept the pastors and the preachers, or a, at least a governing body giving it a different name, but they kept that system of church government, and they still have it today. And the Reformed churches, the Presbyterian churches, still operate under those uh, facilities. Now, Congregationalism. It involves a measure of democracy in that all members have the privilege of participating in decisions. That doesn't mean it is a democracy. We're not. We are a theocracy. We have a king, but it's, there's nobody on earth that has that kingdom. The king is in heaven, and he is the head of the body. So it involves that. Now, the biblical principle upon which it is based is what is known as the priesthood of the believer. This is a principle that says that each individual believer is capable of relating to God directly through Jesus Christ. There is no higher authority to which to refer matters. An interesting passage about this is in Galatians 1, where Paul had, Eric's, uh, uh, Paul had to argue for his authority as an apostle and beseech his readers to follow his instruction. Erickson noted again, quoting, the apostles made recommendations and gave advice, but exercised no real rulership or control, unquote. Each congregation selects its old pastor and leaders, it establishes its own budget. It owns or leases its own property. It governs its own policies and programs. Mm -hmm. Leaders are considered servants to the congregation, not rulers of it. The only authority they have is what is specifically delegated to them, usually by a constitution governing the church approved by the congregation. Stewardship is not ownership, and discipleship is not lordship. That's Ken Gangle's quote. Mm -hmm. These autonomous churches 
often will associate themselves with others of the same doctrinal and functional persuasion, sometimes called denominations. <coughs> These are voluntary associations, usually with no authority delegated to the association or its leaders. They do this to show where unity is true, wider fellowship or widened fellowship with others is in the family. It provides training for workers through schools and seminaries and join in the, the mission work of the church by combining resources and privileges. In other words, all of these things that the churches do is done on the basis of the authority of the church but it is done in conjunction with other people within the denomination who hold to the same uh, viewpoint as, as uh, any congregational church would. <clears throat> if obligations, such as loans for buildings, are made to the association or the denomination, then the association may have regulations over the congregation. But these are voluntarily assumed and not otherwise required. For instance, if we wanted to add on to our building and we wanted to go to the free church organization to seek money to support what we're failing to have out of this instead of going to a bank, they, they will do that if they have uh, funds. I assume they have. We've, we've never done it, so I don't know. But you could do that. And if you did that, then they would then have an authority over how that money is handled. And we have to acknowledge that they have the authority to control that, for whatever. Other, uh, the contract, I'm sure, is pretty strong that uh, it would be provided to the church without any problems unless whatever comes up. You know, if there's a split in the church or whatever kind of thing might happen, there may be qualifications in the contract where you are uh, maybe required to pay that money back or whatever. But that's purely voluntary. And the church, local church, must agree to do that. And outside of that, you can't. For instance, we went uh, several years ago, we went to the denomination. I was chairman of the elders at the time, and we wanted to talk about the possibility of some kind of a legal statement to put into our constitution concerning how the church responds to uh, homosexuals and how we would respond if homosexuals tried to do something in our church, uh, come in and take over or participate or whatever, uh, and if we would say, no, you couldn't do it, they could sue. And sometimes they won those suits. But if we had a regulation in our Constitution, which was passed by the congregation, stating exactly what our reference was to these people, then that stood, and they, there was no basis for a, a, a law to be uh, brought against us. So that's the case. Now, but when I went to the free church to ask for help on this, they said, we can't help you. They have no, no way to give us authoritatively even information that I thought was helpful. So finally, what they did do is they gave it the name, I think, of three churches, three churches, one in Minneapolis and a couple others somewhere. And they asked me to contact those churches and ask them what they did. In their, con in their churches, they had the same question and so on. So I did, I contacted the other churches and we got information from them, samples of the, the uh, motion that they had passed in theirs. And uh, so they helped us in that sense. But they couldn't, they couldn't uh, authoritatively <coughs> tell us what we should do. That had to be determined by the congregation. Mm. So it's a very loose relationship, but it, it has its strengths. Of course, our seminary, provides uh, opportunity for pastors from all of these free churches all over the country to come and be trained and we, we work together in mission boards and all kinds of stuff where we work together as a de denomination of congregational people. Does the congregation is the supreme people with people in every every operation of that church. Okay. Now let's go on here. Uh, authority should be exercised because it is accepted by those under it, not demanded by those having it. Authority should be granted, not earned. Acknowledged, but not forced. Authority is not a right, it is a responsibility 
the exercise of which one will be accountable. Notice also that those who are under authority must be also respond to it positively, for they too will be held accountable. Right, now that's an important element here. Look at this. Paul addressed the Egyptian elders. He instructed them to keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made the overseers, the shepherds of the church of God, which he brought with his own blood. Two important words that are used there. First of all, watch over the flock. In other words, this is the sheep. Jesus spoke about the sheep that in John 10, that he had other sheep he was going to bring, and he called us his sheep, and so on. So the sheep is referring to the congregation, but it's the elders that have to keep watch over the flock. That's a responsibility. That's not a privilege. It's not an authority, it's a, it's a responsibility that they have to fulfill. Not only that, it goes on, the shepherds of the church of God, which he had brought with his own blood. So again, the shepherd is the, the one who, who is over the sheep in the sense that he leads it. But he, he, uh, he doesn't treat the sheep by authority. He treats it, keeps it by example. That's why sheep always follow the shepherd. The shepherd never drives the sheep because they don't respond to that. That's built into the sheep. I guess God wanted to give us a nice illustration of how we should function as sheep and shepherds, okay? Shepherds are chosen by the church and they are accountable to them. All right, let's go on. Now, the biblical reasoning behind the authority of the congregation includes the following. And I've given us, I think, 11, uh, 11 concepts here in the next couple pages, which are events that happened in the scriptures in which the elders were involved somehow and tried to give you a picture. What does, what does the Bible say about elders? And this is primarily all of them. I think I've got every reference to elders where they were doing anything are in these 11 points. So if you want to know what elders did in the scripture, this two or three pages will give that to you. Number one, even before the church was established in Acts 1, it tells of the occasion when a replacement was chosen to replace Judas. He had to have lived and witnessed Jesus while he was here on earth to qualify. Of those who did, two men were proposed, we assume, by the apostles. You know, who else would have had even the knowledge to be able to appoint somebody? The apostles who had traveled for three years, they could point to some of these other men that we've never heard of before, but they were followers of Jesus along with the apostles. But they knew that these were two men that we could appoint because they, they qualified. And then they, they present, presented the disciples, or to the disciples, uh, was proposed. And then they cast a lot or a vote. And we again assume that it was the 120 who had gathered together, which comprised the entire church that was present at the time. So there weren't any elders at this point. There were apostles and they were replacing an apostle. And so even the apostles went to the local church and allowed it in its congregation to select who is going to take the place of the apostle. Jesus wasn't there to appoint him anymore. Okay? Now, the first occasion where the congregation was asked to participate was the selection of what we today call deacons. The apostles gathered the disciples together and told them to select seven men from their number who could serve, whose only stated, stated qualifications was to be filled with the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Now again, the apostles taking the lead because that's, there wasn't anybody else. The church was just beginning to function. But notice what they did. They went to the congregation, they went to the disciples, and they asked them to find seven men that they would choose to participate in this uh, task of supporting the feeding proposition that the church was involved in. The people did that. They brought them to the apostles who laid their hands on them and the result was stated in verse 7. That talks about the expansion of the church as a result of that. 
The first occasion where we learn about what we today call foreign missionaries is in Acts 13, where we read that the church in Antioch, there were five men who were called prophets and teachers, and they're named in that passage in Acts 13. While the church was worshiping, the Holy Spirit told them, the church, to set apart two of these teachers, Barnabas and Saul, whom he had called to a special work that involved their traveling to other parts of the world. So you see, this is some time later, probably some years later. And what has happened here is that the Holy Spirit now is functioning in that body of believers at Antioch. And the, he is the one that in, in invited or challenged them to, to find these two men and name them <coughs> and to uh, send them out as representative of the church. And, but it's the church, you see, that finally made the decision, even though it was directed by the Holy Spirit. The church is the body that heard and performed this call and placed their hands upon the two men and sent them off. A further indication that it was the church that had separated and sent them is that when they returned, they called the church together to be accountable to the church about what God had done through them. Acts 14. This is what we're doing right here today and this whole month. We're opening our church to the missionaries, some of our missionaries, to have them report to us what has been going on in their ministry. They have a responsibility as supporters of theirs to do that, to come back and tell us, just like they did back here. Paul, Paul and Barnabas had to do the same thing. Hmm. Now, the modern day ordination of missionaries and pastors is still an action of the church, either as a local church or by the representatives of a group of churches such as a denomination or a parachurch organization. On another occasion, number four, was the conflict of the requirements for salvation recorded in Acts 15. I'd like to have you turn in your Bibles to Acts 15. This is kind of a lengthy one, but it's an important one. And I'd like to have you follow along here as to what happens, okay? <clears throat> now again, an occasion arose in Antioch, which was, I think, at this point still the primary, probably the larger of all the churches. And uh, that's why they, they're involved in it. But, um, there was a, a requirement, a conflict arose in the church at Antioch as to whether or not if a person, a, 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 a non-Jew, were to be one to the Lord, does he have to be circumcised or not? Does he have to follow the law? Do you have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian? Because the Jews were God's chosen people. And you, you, you weren't allowed to bring in other people except the Jews. So that was the question. So what did they do? Well, let's look. Verse, 15, or verse 1. Some men came down to Judea in Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, this brought Paul and Barnabas in a sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some believers, by whom? Obviously by the church, okay? to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. So the church sent them on their way and they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria and they and told how the Gentiles had been converted. Now this news made all the brothers very glad when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. So you hear you've got Paul and Barnabas coming down representing the church in Antioch and they call together the whole church in Jerusalem with the apostles and the, the pastors and the, all the members, everybody, the whole church gathered to hear what was going on and what the question was. Then it says some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. So there were even some people in the church in Jerusalem that believe this way, okay? Now, the apostles and the elders met to consider the question. All right, there's the body of leaders. The apostles were still around, so they were involved, obviously. And then they took the elders who were to discuss uh, the situation. 
After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God? By putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we or our fathers have been able to bear. No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we were saved just as they are. Well, the whole assembly, that's the whole church, became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. James seems to have been the leader, maybe the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. He's the half-brother of Jesus. And he got up and he said, Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking men from the Gentiles, a people for himself. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written, After this I will return and rebuild David's fallen uh, tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it, that the remnant of men may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, that have been made known for ages. In other words, James went back to an Old Testament passage in which it indicated that the Gentiles were going to be part of the church eventually. And he said this is the fulfillment of it. He's seen it through Peter. And so he qualified, he uh, summarizes, he said, it's my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them Tell him to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest time and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. So James picked up three or four serious problems that were prohibitions by the law. And he says we need to hold those prohibitions. But everything else passes away, no longer is valid. Okay. Well, what happened? Then the apostles and the elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, two men who were leaders among the brothers, not elders necessarily, but leaders of some kind. And with them they sent the following letter, quoting the apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without authorization and disturbed you, troubling you, your minds with what they said, so that all anger agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friend Bar dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we're sending them back to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burn you without or with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from mood, uh, food offered to idols, from blood, and from meat strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Then the men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for the encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the brothers. After spending some time there, they were sent off by the brothers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached them. The, the word of the Lord. So what has happened here? You see, this is a really the first important theological question that was causing a division between the Gentiles and the Jews who were believers. How is this going to be handled? Well, they met together as a church. We, we would do the same thing. That's why it's advantageous to have a relationship with other churches. And especially since Jerusalem had always 
traditionally, biblically, been the head of the church, even though at the very beginning, Antioch, I think, outstretched them in, in quantity at least, they went back to Jerusalem. They didn't go to some other little church that had been started elsewhere. They went back to the, the head church, as it were, and sought from them the advice. And then the church there, they met together as a church. It wasn't the elders, it wasn't the apostles who made the decision. They discussed it and talked about it. They brought it to the congregation. And the congregation voted to accept the, the, the qualifications that they agreed on. Now, that to me is probably the, the greatest illustration in the scripture as to the place of the congregation in the authority of the functioning of the church. Okay? Uh, a couple minutes. Let's go on. Number five. The ultimate authority for discipline among Christians is the body of believers. Jesus instructed the apostles that differences between believers are to be solved, if possible, with a personal visit between them. If not responsive, then you take a witness with you and meet again. If that does not bring reconciliation, tell it to the church. At that point, there probably weren't any elders. This was before the church even existed. This is where Jesus was talking about the fact that he was going to build his church. It wasn't there yet. He said, when you get to some disciplines down the road and you have problems, bring it to the church. You know, if you can't solve it between yourself. It doesn't say take it to the elders. Take it to the church. Even the elders are not mentioned in the final examination or excommunication. Six, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth where he had ministered for about 18 months prior to a discipline issue. The church was instructed as to what to do. But it was left to the church, he did not address the elders to decide and obey. 1 Corinthians 5, that passage there. In the second letter, which we possess from Paul, he instructs the church to receive a disciplined member back into fellowship. Commentators do not agree that this person was necessarily the same one referred to in the first letter, who had been excommunicated. But even if it was not, Notice what Paul says. Paul mentions the means by which the discipline was taken. Quoting from 2 Corinthians 2, the punishment inflicted by him by the majority is sufficient for him. There evidently was not a unanimous decision of the church, only a majority of the people. But it's still the church that made the decision, even in discipline. In other words, the leaders of the church in that day did not seem to have the authority to kick anybody out and communicate them because of false doctrine or whatever. Uh, number seven, Paul commanded the church in Thessalonica for accepting Paul's preaching as the word of God. But he gave a better commendation to the church in Berea, which was at his next stop. He eagerly listened to, they listened to his preaching. But then he says, quoting, they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Now, wasn't that amazing? Here's Paul, the apostle. Hmm. And what did Paul say? Was he upset by this? Notice, the apostle was not offended by their rec recognition of a greater authority of the scriptures or their right and recommended responsibility to consult a higher authority than the preacher. Instead, he called them noble. Mm. So there's the case, you see, where the authority, even of an apostle, was questioned to some extent. They went to the scripture to find out if it was true. The scripture was the ultimate authority since Christ was gone. I thought, if my memory serves me right, they, those were the Jews in the synagogue checking the scripture while Paul was preaching to them. But I... So were these believers or Jews checking um, before they converted? It, I guess it doesn't matter. Just I hadn't thought. thought about it. I'm not sure. Yeah. It, it doesn't. I, I never thought of others being involved. It seemed to be the Bereans. Uh, they, the, the church as a whole. Evidently, wasn't a large church, and uh, the church as a whole evidently did this on their own. They did their own Bible study. 
you know, somebody may have raised the issue and uh, they said, what is this? It's a question. What do we do with it? And they, say, they brought it up, discussed it, came up with a decision. And uh, Paul said, yeah, that's, that's the way you need to do it. You know, if you got questions, either go to the ultimate authority, the Bible, or find other authorities who know the Bible and can help you to determine what it is. Dr. Dean, wouldn't uh, it be the Jews that had the scriptures, the Gentiles one that had the scriptures, and that they, they check the scriptures every day to see if what Paul was saying is true? So well, I think this, this was uh, after Paul had written at least one of his epistles. Paul started writing his, his the first epistle seems to have been written about 48 AD. And th these letters to the church at Corinth were written about five or six years later after he'd been there and taught them and then he left the church. Now he's going back and, and uh, bringing this thing, so, stuff up. So there was, there was the, the scriptures were basically what Paul had written. I don't know the gospels. Would they have had the scriptures? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking went over to Macedonia and, and then he went to Berea and, Berea. It seems like that was kind of an initial thing, but it seems odd that they would have already had Paul's scriptures. You know, I, I well, the scriptures would have been primarily the Old Testament. More. And evidently, what Paul was talking about wasn't New Testament doctrine anyway, necessarily. Right. And so, the, what he was preaching was basically Old Testament truth that applied to the New Testament. And that's, they went back to the Old Testament then and, and from the scripture found the response. Yeah, so that's the reason I would assume that they, they were uh, Jews. That could be. That yeah, it could very well be. Preaching to and they are searching the old the scriptures. Yeah. Uh, it could very well be, you know, that, that Paul in his message would probably have brought up prophecies that were fulfilled because the church had now been established and prophecies in the Old Testament. He may have mentioned some of those. Uh, so it could have been Jews there that, you know, picked up on that. It, I was assuming that it was at least a Jewish person who had that desire to require baptism or uh, circumcision that may have brought up the question to the Bereans after Paul had left. And that brought everybody together and then they decided. But that's, they were Bereans, so they... There may not have been any Jewish people in their their midst. I don't know. We aren't given that information. So. Was Berea a Roman city? Yeah, but it's well, not like, a not like, a major uh, city. Uh, Philippi is. Was Philippi Roman was city. was the head of the area. Yeah. So I've been watching this series called Drive Through Acts. There's the drive through the Gospels where the guy he's it's solid Christian. He drives through all of the places. And now he's doing it there, and and he just left Philippi and went to Berea because he's driving through the uh, movements of, of Paul and Timothy, and I think Silas was with him. And there was a synagogue in Berea, mm -hmm. and it was, I believe, if I remember what the show said, it was a Roman province, but they were allowed to self-govern. And they even have these scriptures there in a monument. Okay. I don't. I don't remember those details. So you're probably right. But it's a pretty good show, and I'll go back and watch that episode. To <laughs> That's good. All. Sounds good. Yeah. I'd like to see it too. It's on Amazon. <clears throat> okay. Well, that's as far as we can get today. So let's close up with a word. We're so thankful, Father, that uh, as we look at the ways that people have organized the church through the years. Some of them have gotten way off step because of their uh, evidently accessing the uh, way the world operates and felt that a church needs to operate similarly to the world. But you have set up a position with the church which uh, does not follow the way of the world. We're to follow the scriptures. You've given us instruction as to how to function. You've given us the names of the people who are to be leaders. You've given us example after example of what these leaders did. We learn from even the leaders themselves what they required, what they had to do, and even what the, how they felt about the, the, the responsibility that they had been given. 
And we're thankful, Father, that all of this information is here for us to use and develop. And we pray, Father, that you'd help us to comprehend this. And uh, we just want to thank you, Father, that we feel that our church is in the right spot. Yeah. So we pray your blessing upon us now as we leave. Use us this week, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.